Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to focus on the factors affecting the acidity of the alpha position in carbonyls. So whenever we are thinking about reactions of carbonyls in general, there are typically two types of reactions that come to mind. That is going to be either the nucleophilic addition to a carbonyl, like additions to aldehydes or ketones, or acyl substitution reactions which are characteristic to the carboxylic acids and their derivatives. However, we can also have the deprotonation of the alpha position, which leads to the formation of the corresponding enolates. And before we go any further, I want to real quick here go through the alpha-beta-gamma nomenclature, just so we're on the same page with that. So whenever we have a functional group and that functional group is connected to a chain of carbons, the very first carbon connected to that functional group is going to be the alpha carbon. The next carbon is going to be beta carbon, then we have gamma carbon, delta carbon, and epsilon carbon, and so on, uh, for as long as the chain continues. Likewise, if we have any hydrogens on those positions, like for instance, if I have a hydrogen over here, we are going to refer to that as the alpha carbon or this hydrogen over here, we are going to refer to that as the beta hydrogen. Likewise, in the case of the carbonyls, we can also use the same nomenclature. For the carbonyl compounds, like aldehydes or ketones, or any other carbonyls, the carbonyl itself is going to be the uh, functional group, which means that the two positions nearby are going to be our alpha carbons. The next one is going to be the beta position, then we have gamma position, delta, epsilon, and so on. Typically, we are going to focus our attention on the alpha positions that are right next to a carbonyl, and on a rare occasion we are also going to be looking at the chemistry of the beta position. For the purposes of this video, today I am only going to be looking at the alpha position. Now, when we know what exactly the alpha, beta, gamma, etc. positions are, we can jump into some chemistry. So, let's say we are going to start with something as simple as just an acetone molecule. I am going to treat this acetone with a base. The nature of the base is not relevant for us right now. What is relevant is that in the alpha position, right over here, we have hydrogens. So I'm going to indicate those hydrogens. And this base can come in and pull one of those hydrogens off, giving us the corresponding conjugate base of our carbonyl compound. Here, here, our conjugate base is going to look like so. And importantly, this molecule is stabilized by the resonance. So I could draw the resonance contributor that I already have on the screen, or I can move my electrons around like so, giving me the resonance contributor with the minus on the carbon. First of all, when it comes to this anionic species, we are going to call it an enolate anion or just enolate for short. Another important aspect of this uh, resonance stabilized species is that we have two different contributors here. The left contributor with the minus on the oxygen is going to be our major contributor, and the contributor with the minus on the carbon is going to be our minor contributor. And because of this resonance stabilization that we have for our enolate anion, the pKa of our alpha position, of our protons in the alpha position, is going to be actually comparatively low. It is going to be around 19. If I were to compare it to, let's say, a simple alkene, let's say something like propane, well, if I take similar hydrogens that I have on my propane over here, then the pKa of that position is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 60, which is not even comparable. That number is completely astronomical. So the resonance stabilization that the carbonyl provides is quite a big deal, which means that the more resonance we have, the more stable our enolate anion is going to be, so the more acidic the carbonyl going to be. So, for instance, let's look at the situation like that, where I now have a couple of protons sitting over here in between two carbonyls. Well, if, like in the previous case, I take some sort of a base, and like in the previous case, the nature of my base for right now is irrelevant, the base can come in and pull one of those protons off. Of course, this enolate, just like the one up above, is stabilized by resonance as well. So I can draw a resonance structure where I push my electrons onto the carbon, which would look like this, and I can further push those electrons towards my second carbonyl, giving me the following resonance contributor. Now, if we carefully analyze these resonance contributors, we are going to see that now we have 
two major contributors and one minor contributor. So in this case we have a significantly more stable enolate and because of that we would expect that the pKa of our original carbonyl it's going to be significantly lower. If we look at the pKa table and locate that species in the pKa table, we will see that the pKa for these protons in between carbonyls, they are actually around 9, which means that we have 10 to the 10th power difference in the acidity of our carbonyls. So the resonance is definitely a big deal. And the more resonance stabilization you have for your enolate, the more stable it is going to be. Now, when it comes to the acid-base properties, we know that the resonance is not the only factor that is going to affect our acidity. In addition to resonance, we commonly look at the atomic size of the atoms with a negative charge, the electronegativity of the atoms with a negative charge, the inductive effects, and finally the hybridization. And since all enolate ions are going to be very similar to each other, we are going to have the differences in the resonance, but we are not really going to typically see the difference in the atomic sizes with a negative charge. The negative charge is typically going to be on either carbon or oxygen. Because of that, we're also not going to see any differences in the electronegativities of atoms with a negative charge. Again, our charge is going to be between carbons and oxygens typically. However, we can see the differences in inductive effects. And of course, hybridization here is not going to be applicable because of the same reasons. It's always going to be carbon and oxygen and all enolates are going to be very similar to each other. So looking at the inductive effects, we know that if we have some sort of electron withdrawing groups in our molecule, that typically stabilizes the negative charge indirectly and makes our molecule more acidic. Well, let's look at a couple of examples here as well and see if that is applicable in our case or not. As my reference molecule, I'm going to use this acetyl acetone molecule and the pKa of my hydrogen over here is going to to be around 9. If I now look at a very similarly looking molecule, but instead of the CH3 groups that I have over here, I have the CF3 groups, fluorines are very electron withdrawing atoms, so we should be seeing the lower uh, pKa values and our molecule should be more acidic. And indeed, if we pull up the pKa value for this proton over here, that one is actually going to be around 5.3, so we do see a significant drop in the pKa value, which means that our molecule is significantly more acidic, just like what we predicted. Well, what if I have a couple of oxygens? Would that give me the same picture? Well, if I pull up the pKa value of this proton that is located between two asters, I'm going to see that that pKa value is actually 12.9. So what's going on here? Oxygens are also electron withdrawing atoms, but how come all of a sudden now we have a less acidic molecule with a higher pKa value? That doesn't seem to be fitting the trend. Well, the trick here is that we have a competition of resonance and inductive effects. In the case of my CF3 group, fluorines pull electron density towards themselves through all of those bonds and we have a very significant delta plus on this carbon. So fluorines pull electron density and don't give anything back. They do not participate in any kind of resonance. So once we pull one of those protons off, so let's say once we pull this guy off, we are going to end up with an enolate looking like this, where my negative charge, my electrons on the carbon, are stabilized directly by the resonance and they are also stabilized indirectly by the inductive effect of the CF3 group. Now, how would this reaction look like in the case of an ester? So I have my ester over here and I'm going to treat it with some sort of base. Again, the nature of my base is irrelevant for right now. The base is going to come in and pull off one of those hydrogens, giving me an enolate looking like this. And I am drawing my minor resonance contributor here on purpose. Because here, for this minor resonance contributor, I can have the resonance stabilization with the carbonyl looking like so, giving me the following resonance structure with the minus on the oxygen. But at the same time, I have this oxygen on the left side, which is competing for the resonance stabilization as well. So I can draw another resonance contributor here, looking like this. This is of course going to be a minor resonance contributor as well. Not only we have created extra charges, but also the 
extra negatives that we have uh, between the oxygen and the carbon here going to be repulsing each other, making it unstable on top of that. But nonetheless, despite the fact that this is a minor contributor, we have a competition in our resonance. We have a competition between the carbonyl and the CH2, and we have a competition between the carbonyl and the oxygen. And whenever we have a competition, it means that our carbonyl cannot fully stabilize either or, which means that now we have a less of a stabilization for our negative charge than if we did not have that oxygen. So instead of helping, the oxygen is actually disrupting our resonance, making the overall structure less stable. So remember, whenever we are dealing with the resonance stabilization, here, adding to the resonance making one long continuous chain of conjugation is going to be good for stability. However, if you are fighting for the resonance, if there are multiple groups that are fighting for the same pi bond, for the same carbonyl, that is going to be pretty bad for our stabilization. And the stronger the resonance stabilization within the carboxylic acid derivative functional group itself, the worse it is going to be at stabilizing the alpha position of the enolate. So, for instance, if we look at just a ketone where we do not have any competition for the stabilization of the enolate once we pull this proton off, our PKE is going to be around 19. If we have an ester, where now, if we were to pull this proton off, we do have a competition from the oxygen and all of a sudden our PKA value is going to jump to roughly 24. And if I jump to something like an amide, where the participation of this nitrogen in resonance is pretty big, then in this case, pulling off this proton is going to be even more unfavorable because now the stabilization from our carbonyl is going to be even less and if we were to measure our PKA value, we are going to see that we are at 25 or 26 depending on the exact structure. So the take-home message here is that you really got to know your PKA values and that is going to be extremely important because as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, we can have situations where we have multiple alpha positions. For instance, let's say we have a molecule like that. I have an alpha position over here between my carbonyls and I have another alpha position over here on the side of the molecule. The PKA of my position in between the carbonyls is going to be somewhere around 9. The PKA of my position on the edge is going to be somewhere around 19 because that one is only stabilized by a single carbonyl group. So now, if I were to react it with some sort of a base, let's say we are going to take something ridiculously powerful, like let's say an LDA molecule, which is one of the most powerful powerful bases that you are going to see within the scope of your course. This guy is capable of pulling either of those hydrogens, but because this position is so much more acidic than the other one, we are going to be exclusively pulling off that proton, which means that we are going to get exclusively this enolate with, of course, all of the resonance structures, so we are going to get 100% of this guy, while the other option, this enolate, is not going to be formed at all, so I'm going to cross it out. So make sure you know your PKA values, otherwise it will be too easy for you to fall into the trap, and this is the last thing that we want to happening during the exam. But the good news is, you don't have to memorize the entire PKA table. When it comes to the PKA values that you should memorize, there are just five typical characteristic compounds that we are going to see. The first one is going to be just a simple ketone. The PKA of those is going to be somewhere around 19. Next one is going to be our ester. Those guys are about 24. Then we have a diketone, which is going to be roughly 9. Then we have an ester plus a ketone, which is going to be roughly 11. And finally, we have a diester, which is about 13. So there are only five magic numbers that you will have to memorize for your class. Everything else, all the other carbonyls and carbonyl-like compounds, going to be in the vicinity of these five numbers. So I recommend make yourself a little flashcard or a small cheat sheet of some sort, so you have those five numbers with you all the time, and you can have them as a quick reference guide, and you can easily use them whenever you need to, and very quickly you will just memorize them without having to sit down and actually memorize them. Now, 
In this video, I talked about the factors that influence the acidity of the carbonyls. In the next one, we are going to talk about the effect of the base on the acid-base equilibrium and the inalization of our carbonyls. So make sure you hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't done so yet, click on this video next, and I will see you next time.